Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks again for joining us. My name is Michael King. I'm the Executive Director here at the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. I'm thrilled to have the chance to welcome you back to this month's uh, Words Writers and Southwest Stories presentation. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and our Log House Museum are located on the traditional uh, lands of the Duwamish people, past and present. We are grateful to the Duwamish people, Seattle's first people, for stewarding this land throughout the generations from time immemorial. Uh, here at the Historical Society, we're really excited about this evening's program and, and to welcome tonight's presenter, uh, Jill Wakefield, who, who will be introduced more formally momentarily. Um, the Historical Society has a, a long collaborative relationship with South Seattle College, uh, of course, the subject of tonight's talk. So this session is especially relevant and meaningful to us, and we, we hope the same is true for you and, and that you share our excitement. Uh, before we move forward, of course, I want to take a moment as well to thank our partners at the Seattle Public Library who make our uh, Words Writers and Southwest Stories series possible. And, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Luna Park Cafe, Four Culture, Duwamish Tribal Services, and Home Street Bank. Uh, again, their generosity makes our free programming possible. So uh, thanks again to them. Um, as one last kind of item of business, uh, I want to remind you that we are hosting our first in-person program since February 2020 here at the Log House Museum this Saturday, July 10th at 1 p.m. Our dear friend Sean Petrie is going to be here on site to do a reading from his award-winning book, uh, Listen to the Trees, which is a, a poetic reflection or exploration of uh, local history here in West Seattle. Uh, he'll be available to sign uh, copies uh, of the book. Uh, if you don't have one yet, you can purchase one here at the Log House Museum. Otherwise, feel free to stop by to, to say hello to Sean, say hi to, to us at the Historical Society. Uh, from what I understand, Sean's going to have his typewriter uh, on site, so I have a feeling there's an opportunity for some poems to be created as well. We're really looking forward to it. Should be a great afternoon, so again, please stop by if you're available. Um, as you know, uh, we uh, here at the Historical Society in these programs for our Q&A, we'll use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with Zoom, you should see a Q&A down at the bottom of your screen there. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A and our moderator will direct it to our speaker uh, on your behalf. Um, with all that said, I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. I'm going to turn things over to Dora Faye Hendricks, who is a, a board member here at the Historical Society and our series chair. Dora Faye. Thank you, Michael. And again, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us one more time. This is going to be a good program tonight. We're honored that Dr. Jill Wakefield is here tonight to share highlights of the history of South Seattle College. Her celebrated leadership through many positions and projects for our community enable students, faculty, and students to excel and move ahead at North Seattle College, Seattle Central College, South Seattle College, and Seattle Vocational Institute. Jill served Seattle Colleges for more than 40 years, starting out as a program assistant in the Veterans Office at South Seattle Community College, and that was before serving as a observing as a public information officer, director of development for institutional advancement, vice president for instruction, and president of South Seattle College from 2003 to 2008. After that, she received the 2016 Seattle University Alumni Award for Professional Achievement. Jill was the longest serving and first female chancellor in the district's history as the Chancellor Emeritus of Seattle Colleges, a three college system with nearly 50,000 students. She retired in 2016 after 40 years of vigorous creative leadership, a legacy that will continue to empower students. Wakefield was able to start a wine program at South Seattle College and a nursing program and healthcare training center at Pacific Tower on Beacon Hill. As a result, she was able to work with business and industry to meet workforce needs and help to prepare students for access to family wage jobs. Other evident passions in Wakefield's career are closing the equity gap, leveling playing fields, easing the transition from high school to college and providing the education for students to move ahead in the economy and providing employers with skilled labor. Away from campus, 
Wakefield served on and led boards, commissions, and task force to help advance hearing. She tells me that she has two grown sons. She loves to play tennis. Um, professionally, again, she was an innovator at the highest level of her education profession. The colleges she led were the first in the state and among the first in the nation to embrace the applied baccalaureate degree. Building on technical skills, students could compete, complete, I'm sorry, the general education requirements of a bachelor's degree. So welcome Dr. Will uh, Wheatfield to our Words, Writers and Southwest Stories. Well, thank you oh, so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorfe. And um, it's been really fun to, uh, to look back at the history of the college. And I see in the audience that there are a number of people who actually worked at the college or who know me and the college. So I'm gonna ask them to keep me honest because I wasn't able to get onto the campus to get a lot of the information. So I use different reports. And if I wasn't sure, I sort of estimated. I realized this is the wrong, uh, the wrong audience to sort of guess. So um, if you worked at the college, please keep me honest. And if I got a wrong date or I missed something, um, I want you to make sure that you tell me. So um, with that, I'm so happy to be here and to share the history, what I think is one of the most innovative uh, creative, successful community colleges in the nation. And I was just honored to be there for work more and uh, for 35 years. I think I had more jobs than anybody else. So uh, with that, I'm gonna share my screen, um, a few uh, slides. So, uh, this is really going to be the official or almost official history of South Seattle. Uh, I got my information from a number of sources. It was an uh, oral history written by President Rosie Marmondo. Uh, also, the college is 50 years old now, so we've had a number of publications. And then just the ideas, different events as I remember them. Um, so I want to start with how South Seattle came to be. Now, it's interesting, when I came in 19, mid 70s, I had no idea of two things. One, that I was in the college's infancy. It was only like four or five years old. And I wondered why so many people had three or four different jobs. It was a very young institution. The second thing that surprised me is I had no idea that I would stay for 35 years. So to really see and be part of the whole development of the institution. So this is sort of how it began. In 1941, the state legislature actually authorized community colleges. However, they were prohibited in areas that already had public universities like Seattle. So you saw a lot of the community colleges that were developed in smaller towns, Walla Walla, Big Bend, uh, Yakima, uh, uh, Centralia, where I attended. Uh, there were a lot of colleges, but there were, there were no community colleges in the cities. So 1961, the legislature removed this provision and 64, the Seattle School Board and most of the community colleges came out of the K-12 system. So the school board applied for authorization to open community colleges in Seattle. And it was to open three, uh, three district college. Uh, one would serve the North End, one would serve the Central Area and one would serve the South uh, Area. So 65, Permission was granted, they moved ahead, they started planning for this district, um, uh, Seattle schools. And so you notice a lot of the early administrators came from the K-12 system. Well, 69, um, South Seattle opened, was first established as a campus, but the colleges were held at what was then the Duwamish site, West Seattle High School, the Hogate site, I believe Van Asselt Elementary School. There was nothing on campus. Well, 1970, we had our first groundbreaking, it was more mud breaking up on the 63 acre uh, campus up on um, 16th Avenue uh, Southwest. And then September, our first classes opened and aviation and then diesel mechanics. So uh, now 
South has a little bit of the stepchild syndrome, and um, there's always been a little competition among the three colleges, and I kind of wondered why, and I think we've come up with a reason, but it was always, I remember there was a time when West Seattle was going to secede from Seattle, and we were kind of hoping that West Seattle would take us with them. Um, so the long range plan um, was written that South was the first to be built because the need was the greatest. There was the least access to higher education there. However, it became the last one. So there's two theories about that. Well, the, and this person was key to South Seattle's development. And I'll tell you who it is if you haven't guessed it. Um, oh, John, <laughs> jo John Inger, do you, have a comment? Can't. I can't see. Dora Faye, John Inger raised his hand. I know, but I can't. He has to write it in the chat room or the question okay. and answer, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, while you're writing that, I'm going to go to the next one. Um, so here's the truth about how South of Seattle was built. Well, here's a thought. Was it a sibling rivalry, but that the central and north campus officials just put more pressure on the school board? So they were uh, so vocal that they basically took our money um, and they built north and central first. And Dorfe, just stop me whenever you get the question. Now, there is another there's another thought. And uh, this one is that the owner of the gravel pit where South Seattle is now located, they wanted $2 million, but the land was appraised at 1.2 million. Well, so the college district went to court and claimed eminent domain. Well, the property owner wasn't happy. So he hired an attorney named John Ehrlichman to represent him. Well, John Ehrlichman lost and joined the Nixon administration as counsel for domestic affairs. I often wonder what would happen if he would have won, but um, that's the end of the story. So John Ehrlichman played an important role in our life. Yes. Excuse me, uh, James, well, that's not who you were looking for an answer from, but the answer suggested was Halderman or Ehrlichman. Ehrlichman wins. So yeah. if I had prizes, uh, free <laughs> tuition, you'd win. <laughs> So that's our story. We love we love our John Ehrlichman story. So that kind of tells you the history and why why we were the third one. Now there was not a controversy about where the college was located, but there was also a lot of controversy about the name. Um, and that controversy of those that are on the call from South will know that controversy has still not ended fifty years later. So when the site was drawn, um, the plans are drawn, the site wasn't selected, but they had to have names for these three colleges. So I think our trustees thought they were very savvy and they asked the West Seattle Chamber of Commerce to survey for a name. Uh, so they did just that and came up with the West Seattle College was the preferred name. Um, well, out of the 36 names submitted, none was South Seattle Community College. So this little editorial is from, I'm pretty sure the West Seattle Herald, something about a slap in the face. And it also makes comments about the uh, uh, ridiculousness of the Board of Trustees. Now, today I had lunch with um, Cleo Corcoran, who's the widow of George Corcoran, who's our first president. And her view was that the reason they didn't select West Seattle College was they were really worried about the power of the West Seattle community. So this was a deliberate move to take away the power from the West Seattle. So who knows, but it hasn't stopped now. If you've seen our class schedule, South Seattle Community College in West Seattle, there's the maps, there's where they are in West Seattle. Here we are, South Seattle in West Seattle, West Seattle. <laughs> And then when we had the uh, uh, first groundbreaking ceremony in 1970, again, the, air, it, the real challenge was uh, this, it's a great open house if you can find the campus. So it's always been a challenge to find the campus. And then, you know, the road to get there is pretty awful also. So um, when I was public information officer for several years, one year I came up with a great motto 
I thought it was the best ever. It was a good college, it's hard to find. Well, evidently I'm the only one that I'm used because we stopped using it within a few months, but I still thought that it had some, um, it sort of described what it was like to, to find South Seattle Community College. Still kind of a challenge um, that, and that comes from 1970. So, when I was thinking about this, uh, the history of the college, and um, I was thinking about, are there some themes over the years? And I think there's a few. One is that there's always been an incredible student focus at South Seattle. Um, the faculty and staff are dedicated and totally dedicated to students wherever they are, they'll go where they are and they'll take them to where the students want to go. So students who come to South know that people care and know that will really help them get they're, where they're going. The second is innovation. Uh, for some reason, South has always been known for innovation. It may be the technical programs, maybe just there was this whole attitude, and I think it goes from Jerry Brocky. Our attitude was, let's just do it. So we really didn't, we weren't big on planning, and so I know we could start a program in about 30 days, um, but we, if we saw an opportunity, we just did it. And so a lot of the ideas were have become innovations that have been looked at uh, across the nation, actually. Partnerships. South Seattle's always been about partnerships, about the community, higher, ed higher education, business, with Boeing, with employers, um, with organizations. Uh, partnerships has really been part of the college from, from its inception. And then, um, and community connections. This was a college, when we opened the college, it was important what the community thought. And so we reached out, we've asked the community what they thought. The college was developed so that the community come up and uh, to campus and go to the floristry shop, have lunch, buy pastry, um, use one of the services, come to the Arboretum. It's always been really designed to get people here. Now I'm gonna take a risk, it's also about people. And especially the people that helped found the college in the first year, in the first uh, few years, which would be the early 70s. These were some of the individuals, I know I've missed some and you'll tell me who I've missed, that I got to know when I was at the college, they were very involved in the institution and they were committed. And, and one, the Cowdens, um, where I believe, and someone will correct me, that they started the West Seattle, um, uh, the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. And they also worked with the college. And so in the Smith building, there is a room that is designed, that is the property of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. I've never been there, but it's somewhere by the music programs. So there was a strong connection to this organization and the college from the beginning. But others, um, and I talked to uh, Helen Sutton, who was my mentor and who ran a lot of things in West Seattle. Uh, she made sure that no one messed with her college. And when I was running for president, when I was a candidate for president, she called the chancellor and perhaps the board and pretty much threatened them all that if they didn't hire me, she was gonna stick West Seattle on them. I'm not sure what that would have meant, but um, it felt good having her, having her support. So these are some of the people at the beginning and John Inger, you can correct me if there's some others that should have been should added to the list. Now, there are a number of South employees who've been connected also with the organization and Judy Bentley, um, who's one of our star faculty members. I think she was like our rock star. Uh, we had it, she was an author. She was an incredible English faculty member. She was a leader in the faculty. And, and I know that she's been very involved in this organization too, but I was just honored to work with her. And um, she really, I think she really has probably made a difference as much as anybody else. And I know that there's a lot of other faculty on this group, on this call that have um, played a huge role in the development of the institution. I ran through it a little bit, but Joanne Mraz, she was our first art instructor and she's a twin sister of Diane Ties. So um, Joanne was also involved um, now uh, from the college from the beginning and kept us connected. Um, I thought one of the more interesting times was when 
um, Lou Tice's mother, I can't remember her name, she came to the college and she was about 80. She was active in student government. I think she was an officer. She was a pistol. We always thought that was one of those were fun days. Randy um, Nelson and I think Peter is that father. Um, Randy uh, worked, uh, was our, one of our librarians, also has kept all the historical records about the college. So I'm sure I've used many that of uh, the materials that he collected. And then Joanne Stover, one of my favorite people. I, share, I had an office close by next door. Um, one of our first science, I think she was our first science and chemistry instructor. Um, and just, um, and th there may be others that are uh, so, uh, connected, but it's just an example of how many employees uh, have been connected with the, with the community in so many ways, because that's part of who's, what South is. So um, the call in 69, going back to when the college opened. That's when we opened, and I mentioned that several locations, uh, but our programs, and I think some of them came from Seattle Central, from Edison Tech. We had aircraft mechanics, Boeing drafting, diesel, landscape horticulture, continuing education, ESL. So we were all over the place um, that first year. Uh, then in uh, January, uh, 1970, we had the groundbreaking or the, I think it was a mud pit. Um, and what, this is the program. What kind of impresses me is look at the number of people on the Citizens Advisory Council. There were over 50 and my understanding is 130 people applied. This is a very diverse group of community leaders, members, all sorts of organizations and, orga and companies are represented. Um, and it speaks to how important uh, it was for the college to be connected to the community. So this was our, our first, um, this is when we kicked off. So this is what the design was, this is what it was going to look like. And um, the automotive building looks like this and the aviation building looks like that. And the cafeteria kind of looks like this. I kind of think that after this, they threw this away because I've never seen any of these buildings. Uh, there is nothing that looks like that now, but it was a good vision. And, um, you know, it looked kind of cool. It just didn't happen. So here are the colleges in 2019. Um, I think it's become a really beautiful campus and it's becoming even prettier now. We realized that for the, the whole history of the college, it was very internally looking. And so the last building, which I think is the Cascade, um, uh, sorry, here, the Cascade, oh, a second here. Uh, Cascade Court, the Cascade, actually, it looks at 16th. It invites people in. It's sort of one of the first buildings that says, come on in. And, and then it opens up some green spaces in the campus. So there's been a, as a college has developed, there's been a real focus on, on creating a really beautiful campus. And I think that uh, every building is sort of getting to that point. So that's the, so in 1970, um, the main campus opened in the fall and we had aviation and diesel mechanics classes, about 650 students. That first graduation, we had 90 people in attendance. We had 25 graduates. It was held in the automotive building. Um, and 1971 was a big year for South Seattle. That's when our academic transfer programs began. Um, we are, our uh, at this point, we were more of a technical college, and so it was really important if we were going to be a community college that we needed to offer the academic transfer programs so that we would have transfer for those that were going on to a university, um, as well as the technical. And so it was a small program. We had five faculty, um, and we... Um, and that program has continued to grow throughout the history and uh, to it's what I think we're getting close to half and half, not quite, but um, a more uh, focus on transfer programs. So I want to go a little bit about the presidential lineage because I think it really explains sort of how the college developed. So uh, our first president was Bob Smith. 
came from Central Campus. He was the planning president. My understanding is he went door to door in the community talking to people about the college and about what was there and what they would be. He really set the tone for a campus that would be very welcoming. Was uh, I didn't really know him. He was a great guy, probably the first, a great uh, president for the planning um, to get the college off to a great start, but uh, well liked in the community. In 1977, he had a heart attack and he passed away. So Jerry Brocky, um, who was Dean of Instruction, became president, was president for the next almost 20 years. Now, President Brocky set the tone for casual and sort of the family culture. I think he did a few other things and I want to talk to, I want to, talk to you about them, how he set the tone for the institution because he's also the innovator um, and the one that would said, we can just do this. We didn't have to plan things for too long and um, uh, really did the connections for the community. Peter Koo came in uh, 95, 97 from North Seattle, uh, sort of the transition president. He was here just for two years. And then David Mitchell came from North and he, uh, I think, established um, a reserve fund. And he also built our transfer program. Dr. Mitchell really understood transfer programs, built the transfer program. And then I was president from 2003 to 2008. Um, I had been in many, many jobs. <laughs> I don't know if I couldn't hold one, but I had been uh, jobs at that point. I was vice president for instruction, but um, I had been at South my whole career. I, if I, if I, my pride points probably were partnerships starting the nursing program, the wine program, and the development of the Georgetown campus um, down in the Georgetown area. But um, I think, and then um, I was asked to be the chancellor. And I think it was the first time anyone had ever been asked from South to be the chancellor. Um, and I thought that I had complained enough about the district office that I actually deserved the job. Uh, so I had the chance to move, move on. And then we had Dr. Or Gary Ortley was president from 2009 to 2017, um, who really built pathways. Um, uh, built student success programs, um, really did a lot, I think really helped move the college. He really built the 13th year Promise Scholarship um, and uh, was uh, connected with the community. So, uh, oh, there, <laughs> there we are. And then Rosie Ramondo Sharonsup is president now. Um, she's known for her commitment to create racial equity, ensuring a campus that's kind, inclusive, student focused, where all students succeed. And she's doing a great job. But I want to go back to the Brocky years. Um, and one thing, if you're taking at any notes, on um, Jerry Brocky died last year, and we're having a memorial for him on September 25th at 2 p.m in, of course, the Brocky Center. Um, so I hope that if you know people, if you're interested in coming, um, that you get the word out that we're having this event to really honor our longtime president. Now, we're gonna actually, because of Jerry Brocky and what he would think is important, we are gonna go to the winery and we're going to toast him also, because we think he'd like that. But if you think of what he built, the built, he built the Smith Building, Culinary Arts, Floristry, Welding, Technology Center, Pastry, Baking Center, the Duwamish Campus. He started programs in machining, welding, culinary arts, pastry, floristry, avionics, digital control, robotics, the computer programs, um, online instruction. Uh, started the South Foundation. He really connected with the community, with industry. People liked him. Um, in, and he represented with such enthusiasm and passion our students. He also really was a good person to fight for South when we're in battles with our sister campuses. Um, he was the one that you wanted to put forward and he also, he also, he often won those fights. Now what people don't know is how, what a great, how he fostered the support of the development of women leaders, including me. Um, he supported a number of women as they moved into higher positions. And what people also don't know is that for many years, the women were almost, were probably running the campus. So um, he probably wouldn't want that. He probably would be okay with that being known now. 
So a little bit about our history. If you look at a college, I think a lot of it, the history is about the development of programs and that really shapes the buildings. Um, it shapes what the campus looks like. It shapes the college culture. So um, I did a little timeline just for me to look at some when some of the programs started um, from 69 on to um, currently. So here was our diesel and heavy equipment mechanics. You know, we had probably up to 300 students in diesel and heavy equipment mechanics. It was a very popular program. It was so popular that we got a building, a new building. Well, the problem was by the time we got the new, we started building the new building, the need for diesel mechanics was less and there was a huge need for technology. So the building became a diesel and uh, computer technology programs to because that was the, the need at the time. In 1970, aviation maintenance moved to campus. Aviation probably is known as one of South's flagship programs. a and mechanics are working at airlines around the world. Continues, we offer day and evening programs. The FAA uh, uh, kind of guides this program. It's quite challenging. It's also an expensive program to run. So we really did not, we relied on um, donations. Again, 1970, the academic program started um, with just five faculty and it continued to grow. And this again was when we were able to really start attracting high school students, more from the community who were interested in that baccalaureate degree. 74, the floristry program opened. And I love the floristry program. People came from campus. I bought my holiday things there. Um, there were people who had their flowers done for weddings and funerals. Uh, the program, we ended up closing the program in the early 2000s because our students, it was a great program, but the students weren't able to get family wage jobs with benefits. We just thought that we couldn't justify a program if the students weren't getting um, jobs that they could, they could live on. And so the good news is though, after we closed the program that we had a uh, cooling uh, uh, unit in there, we were able to open the wine program. Now, I found this, uh, and this was our class schedule for academic programs in 1973. Um, uh, there are not many, it was in the schedule. And then our Dean of in Student Services was also a um, graphics designer. And this kind of shows you how things have changed. It looks like there's a guy with a gun and maybe a purse or a tool belt. And it says, don't rob yourself of the chance to learn more. Um, <laughs> so I think things have changed quite a bit and probably in terms of artwork, much for the better. But our class schedule, this shows how, how um, it was quite condensed. Well, the culinary programs opened in 1975, again, to become, they became one of our flagship programs. Um, we also had the pastry and speci specialty baking, and we set it up so that anyone could come up and have lunch. We also had special dinners, um, and we had a huge holiday dinner to come up, and the president had, I think he was like roasting chestnuts, and he'd welcome people. We'd get hundreds of people from the community to come up and have their holiday dinner there, and then they would buy their pastries and pies from the pastry shop. So it was, the program was a great, uh, was uh, not only enhanced our reputation, but got a lot of people to campus. Uh, here's more construction in the mid seventies when we were putting together the culinary building. There's the Smith building. Um, it's pretty, it was, a la it was construction central the seventies. So 1978, the Arboretum was established and that was a student. The students went to the board and said, we want an outdoor class classroom. And so the board approved a 5.5 acre um, uh, arboretum on the north end of campus. Um, the students spend, uh, it's been their laboratory. It's been developed with uh, the college support, community support, the South Seattle Community College Foundation support over the last decades. I was up there this week. It is absolutely beautiful. And you see a lot of names of those individuals who are really key to the development of South Seattle Community College, the Helen Suttons and the Masserts, and you'll recognize some of the names. Now, 
the gazebo was um, built and I, I was there, I think I took pictures. I was a public information officer. It was the husbands of the members of the West Seattle Garden Society. So it was lots of fun to watch the 60 and 70 year old men on the roof of this um, gazebo while their wives were down cheering them on. Um, but if you have a chance, go to the Arboretum. It is really the college, the program has done an amazing job. Well, in 1980, the welding program started. It actually came from Seattle Central. <clears throat> and um, um, we were, it's always been a strong program. In fact, it expanded to, uh, we have a program now, a partnership with Vigor um, for shipbuilding. So um, uh, the welding program has been a strong one. Um, now, I don't know. I, I was, when I first saw this is where's this campsite? And I can tell you, as far as I know, the homeless are not camped out at South Seattle Community College. This is in the um, 18, 1981. There is a tent on campus. And the reason is students are camping out for a chance to enroll in the aviation program. We really took first come first serve all the way and said, if we're gonna start enrolling at 8 a.m. on Monday, Tuesday morning. And so students would come a day or two before and camp out for a chance to get into those aviation programs. Um, it made great headlines and news stories, but we ended up, we quit doing it after a few years. And I think that was a smart thing. Um, camping on our campus is not really, we really aren't a campground. So now in 1984 was kind of a big deal for South because we made the big leap into the high tech world and we purchased six Hewlett Packard 150 computers. But it was the start of a number of computer uh, technology programs that we developed. Um, to serve the computer industry in the changing world. This is Roger Bure, one of our most popular instructors, was ESL instructor and then taught uh, English uh, for our technical students. Um, one of my favorite stories about Roger Bure was when he taught in the English as a Second Language program. He and Don Bissonette, who looks a little like ZZ Top, um, they taught ESL and Rose Dang, who was a coordinator of the program, assigned them to put on the fashion show. So I always kind of wondered what that fashion show looked like with the Roger and Don, but that's Roger Bure, one of our favorite teachers. Now, 1990, uh, Nobi Chan went to the board and said, we really want to put the Chinese garden there. So there, there's a long-term lease for the Chinese garden to be at South Seattle at the North End. Um, it's under, still under development, but it's a beautiful place to visit. Um, and when it's finished, I think it's going to be amazing. But it's to connect our students um, and programs with China. Uh, when I became president, um, I, had a, I had a visit from a local legislator and the president of CMAR who said, Jill, we want you to start a nursing program and we want you to start it for those for whom English isn't their first language. And we want a model that goes from CNA to LPN to RN and beyond. And I forgot that Jerry Brockie had once told me, you should never, never, never start nursing programs. So I said, okay. And I didn't know that it really wasn't possible to do that, but we were able to do it anyway. It was tough, but we started a program, which was the CNA and uh, to move to LPN. And what we learned in that program quite by mistake was we had in the CNA program, very few of the students spoke English. So we decided that we would go ahead and put the, the CNA instructor, this nursing assistant instructor and the ESL instructor in the classroom, two instructors, and see if we could get them through. Well, the huge surprise was that students made more progress in the English as a second language and the CNA than if they had taken either one. And that program was expanded throughout the state and is now a national model called IBEST, which is used across the country uh, as, we no long, as we start moving students into programs um, before they have um, a uh, high level of English. We found that we can learn, uh, they can learn, um, they can learn both and they can learn better. And so uh, quite by accident, we developed a national model. The nurse, 
tasting program or the wine program um, Dorfe mentioned um, started in 2004. And this one was because for years I've been trying to get mortuary science on campus. I thought we had a culinary program. We had landscape horticulture. We had um, floristry. I thought, I thought what could be better? And no one was interested. And then I saw that wine programs were being developed at Walla Walla and Yakima. And I thought there's no program here where they make the wine. And so I said, I asked folks, what do you think about a wine program? And I have to say, I got 100% almost um, uh, said, yeah, let's do it. And it, it fit the culture of South really well. So we started the, the wine program and I, we usually do a lot of research before we start these programs. On this one, I knew that we needed to get it before the college that served Woodenville did. So I basically, we just did the paperwork and put it in and got it approved before anyone else did. And within the first year or so, we had 300 students. So again, it's one of our most fun programs, um, one of the fastest growing. And um, if you haven't tasted their wine, it's great. So here's here's a tasting class in session. I, don't, I know this clearly, I think, is an A student. But um, you'll find this wine all over the state. I was in Spokane last weekend and one of the stores had it there. Uh, so the wine program, it fits well with South, fits with the culture, fits with the um, uh, culinary program. And the, the, um, the building you saw used to be um, actually a machinist building. And we hired an architect and it's an absolutely gorgeous winery. Um, one of the most popular programs at the college. 2006, um, let's see how we're doing. Um, we opened our university center and that was to really to give attention to our transfer program is growing. We wanted our university partners to know about it. We also wanted to have a place for academic students and faculty. Um, and I think that it really was successful in growing our transfer program. Um, and we started 2007, our bachelor degree programs. We were one of the first pilots in the state. Only four programs were approved. Um, South was approved. And um, now there's a bachelor applied baccalaureate degree in probably, I think almost every college or somewhere between 50 and 75 uh, baccalaureate degrees. They work well for people that are place bound and for our technical students um, and for our students of color. They've, um, they've been very successful in helping people get family wage jobs. There's our first graduating class. And then um, 2008, we started the 13th year Promise Scholarship. The foundation said, we want to support our tuition. We want to support our local graduating seniors. We are going to raise, a, we're going to raise money to give every student a one-year scholarship. It became a national model, it led to Seattle Promise, which is a partnership with the Seattle Colleges, City of Seattle, and Seattle School District for all graduating students. This is Gary Ortley and Rosie Ramondo worked really hard on this. Um, and a lot of the things you hear at the national level are um, because of the good work that was done through the 13th year scholarship. This is the first class. Uh, we also changed our name. The reason we changed our name was that the baccalaureate students said, uh, came to the board and said, you know, we're applying for jobs and we're not getting them because employers don't believe community colleges offer baccalaureate degrees. So like most colleges that offer uh, applied baccalaureate degrees, uh, the community, we took community out of our names. Um, that was a hard decision because um, community, we are the community's college, but we wanted to make sure our students are well served. Uh, 2018, uh, Cascade Court, uh, Cascade Hall opened. That looks the one that looks at 16th Avenue. That's where we put our nursing program, um, uh, ESL, basic studies, and general classrooms. It's one of the most beautiful new buildings there. This is just a campus looking north. Um, one thing about South, we're known for diversity. It's probably one of, between South and Highline, they're the most diverse colleges in the state of Washington. 50 to 60% are students of color. It's because where we're located, the programs, and we are committed. South is committed to the success of every student. So we value every diverse student. And I have to tell you, going through graduation, seeing a student who started in ESL and is finished with a great job or a great scholarship to the University of Washington will make anyone stay. Uh, this was just to show a little bit about how the, um, our diversity is about 60% students of color. And in our programs, 
transfer students are now 30 to 35% um, and so we're spread around. Um, so balance between technical and academic. So our start here, go anywhere really describes South Seattle. It's from its beginning, it's been a place where if you need a second chance, if you need a new job, if you need to learn English, if you're ready to transfer, if you wanna go on for a baccalaureate degree, um, you wanna just take Spanish like I did, this is a place to start and you can go anywhere. I guess I'm an example. I started here and I could go anywhere, however I stayed. <laughs> so this is my, I end with this one. Um, we've attracted the attention of a lot of important people um, who really believed in South Seattle, like the innovative programs. And so a highlight for me was when Jill Biden uh, visited our aviation program, talked to students, and I just have to feel so excited that she's in the White House now because it's gonna be a good time. It's a good time for community colleges, people who recognize that community colleges can truly change, change the country and change the lives of every student here. So with that, I'm, no, I know I forgot. So my questions are, what, who did I forget? What's your connection with South? And do you have any memories you wanna share? I have a couple of questions that have come in already, Jill. Okay. Um, you have already touched some of this history, but could you talk about the early designation of South as a college in the district that would be technically slash vocationally focused? Do you know how that um, emphasis was chosen? I've been asking, I have asked, and maybe some more know more than I do. I think that in the beginning, it was because of the programs. A lot of them came from, um, from the Edison Tech. And I don't know how or why, but I think it was felt that South was the college that was the location of the colleges that could really uh, um, kind of strength, could really be the focus for technical programs. But I can't find anything that says, technical programs. In reality, they're all now about 50-50. So however the colleges started, or not 50-50, but they've all moved. So whatever the initial is, I'm not sure, but we've, uh, nobody was trying to keep it, keeping track of what our programs were over the years. So um, they've all moved out, North has become more technical. Um, Central has a balance of technical and academic and South does too. So I don't know what the vision was, but um, we're all much more balanced now. Oh, good. You might be interested in that question came from Judy Bentley. <clears throat> A little more history here. Clay Eels yeah, um, is sharing some. Yeah, the Southwest Seattle Historical Society got started in 1984, some 13 years before the museum became our home. So the college was our initial home where we stored artifacts, held many meetings and even got our mail. All of this happening with a handshake agreement between our father, fa founder, Elliot Cooden, and the college president, Jerry Brockley. You worked directly for Jerry for many years. Can you tell us more about what in his personality provided the insight to foresee the fitting connection between the historical society and the college? Also, tell us about his handshake. Tell me about what? His handshake. So who, who is that from, Judy? Or no, that else? one's from Clay. Oh, from Clay. Clay. Hi, Clay. Yes. Clay, yes. one of my favorite people, too. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, what, Jerry Brockie was a force to be reckoned with. And he had this, he had an incredible handshake that, you know, he grabbed your hand, he looked at you. Um, he had great sayings. Uh, he had energy um, like no one else. And I think that he, he had a lot of handshake partnerships uh, agreements and he stood behind them. Um, he saw the value of, of the partnerships and that was, that was just who he was. And when people were with him, they just believed him and they just had confidence in the college. And so, I mean, we had some amazing partnerships with um, employers, with Boeing. They just had real confidence um, because he had confidence. Um, and like I said, he was, um, I think he was the perfect president to build a college because he was strong-minded, strong-willed. Um, you know, you would get to a meeting at 8.05 or maybe it was like 7.05 and he would say good afternoon. 
Um, we, but he also had a lot of fun. So at his event, we're going to show the Uftas where he had, I think we dressed him up like Rambo one year or he could laugh at himself um, and we had fun. Um, so the college really reflects him. He cared about people. Um, really strong-minded. And like I said, is if you wanted someone to fight with the district, he was the one you put up front. Thank you. And, and expand a little bit, if you will, about the, what Clay calls the fitting connection between the Historical Society and the college. I, I just think that it was, it was, once again, the vision. You also know the, the theater, the West Seattle I forgot what it's called. It also started at South Seattle. Um, I think that the leaders were so involved in the community and were so committed. Um, and I remember the Cowns, really nice people. They were, we were been at the, they were at the college. They supported the college a lot um, in many ways also. Um, I think it's really hard to be a college, especially not in the community and to, connect to do that level of connections where the community really believed that the college um, served the community and that was Jerry Brocky with the Historical Society. I know I know that everybody, I know the college wanted that office and I know probably I wanted that office and we put a lot of pressure on him to move the Southwest Seattle Historical Society somewhere else and he wouldn't even budge. Um, so I think that's the kind of person um, he honored his agreements and the partnerships and he knew how important it was that we would have that strong partnership and I, I'm, I'm sure that it's grown over the years um, and it's really benefited the college in many ways that most people don't even know. Very good. John Inger um, Hi, wants John. to say that, that Diane Tice, what, whoops, let it go was one of the names you were trying to think of while ago. D Diane yeah. Tice was a great friend of the, of the um, I know of the Historical Society, um, also at the college. And I think Joanne Mraz really got her involved in, in, in many ways. And um, I had, we had the opportunity to go to a number of Tice Institutes and, and um, um, because of that support. That, that support. Um, and so we are really fortunate to have their support. Super, yeah, thanks. Um, Michael Hickey asks, if you had to pick just one or two specific items, what are your greatest accomplishments at South Seattle College? <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I'm really proud of Georgetown campus. I think we really created something. I mean, it was Quonset huts. It was World War II Quonset huts. They said the, the rats were moving out. It was so bad. Um, and we really developed that um, into a really nice, a nice place. And, you know, I asked, I had meetings with the employers down there and I said, what do you want here? And they were all shocked that a college would ask what they wanted, which I thought was kind of basic. So, um, and also you probably don't know that we needed to get that hat and boots property for um, the, to expand. And um, I tried to get it when I was a brand new president because I thought this is, this is if I fail um, and I failed, it went to someone else and I actually thought I had failed as a president. So that the, it fell through. And at that point we managed to, we got a bunch of lobbyists together and we were able to get it the second time through. And so kind of learned you don't give up um, and one event won't make you decide whether you're a success or failure, but it was a good example for me that when you get that kind of energy, everybody wants to be part of it. Um, I'm also proud of the baccalaureate degrees, applied baccalaureate degrees. South was never supposed to be in the top, in the, in the pilot programs, but we did such a great job. We had the whole hospitality industry. I had Sam Smith, the president of WSU, testifying that Sal should have a baccalaureate degree in hospitality management. It's a program WSU also had. Um, the hospitality industry stepped up, everybody did, and we had an amazing proposal. So um, even, it turned out one of the others wasn't that good, so we were able to get it. So I was really proud of being a pilot program there. Um, and the 13th year, 
I I can't, I, we, I was there when we had the idea, but I think that was just been amazing to get local high school students who never thought college would be an option for them to college. And then you, the faculty who are on this call, you got them through. Um, and a lot of students weren't ready, but you got them ready. And so the faculty on, on the Zoom call are some of our most incredible, but they really, there's a lot of others that are just like them who, said we're, we take we we want to serve the students who come our way so I think that's it Mike and um, and your poetry I think that was a perfect I mean a wonderful answer I'm stammering for words because messages are coming in here but you acted a little modest at first and Jill we are so proud to have you here um, explaining those to us and we're proud for you too um, Lorraine Tolley is Hi. asking if, uh, if you could talk more about the role of the college's foundation. What is it doing now? Also, someone she knows did an upside down degree at SSC where she used the horticulture classes for her major and then went uh, elsewhere for her uh, BA degree, taking her liberal <laughs> arts classes elsewhere. Is this rare or do others do it too? Okay, I'll start with that. Um, it, it's, it depends on the receiving college. Some colleges, I, I'm going to guess that we had partnerships with colleges with horticulture that could pursue baccalaureate degrees. It might have been WSU, might have been CityU. So you can do that. It just depends if the college accepts the technical degree. And uh, we had a great horticulture program. So um, that does happen. In some areas it didn't. Culinary, it really wasn't happening. And so we really felt that it was better to offer the baccalaureate degree. Um, I think the option is this, there just shouldn't be ceilings that you can't um, go beyond. And so um, I'm happy that your, your, your friend was able to get a bachelor degree. A lot of people with bachelor degrees come back to the horticulture program. So that happens also. And Lorraine, what was your other, what was the first part of the question? about the college's foundation. What's it doing oh, now? Um, so I've been away from the college. It's my understanding that there is a district foundation and all three are involved. And I think we have someone here who works with it. And then the, there's still the South Seattle Community College Foundation that gives out um, grants and scholarships. And, and you know, it's my hope that someday they can come together, um, but that's, that's something that they'll have to figure out. But um, that's what I know now. The foundation has been very supportive. You know, it came out of the Citizens Advisory Council, that 50 member and Jer uh, they, I think they had been the advisory council for maybe 15 years. And then uh, they moved to the foundation and Jerry Jensen was the first president of the foundation. So South Foundation has been one of the most successful in the state of Washington, um, especially with the 13th year and others. Um, in raising funds. And, and I think that, um, I'm not sure what the next steps will be, but I think they'll continue um, whichever foundation to make the case that um, students deserve this, deserve and um, are deserving of the support of um, a Friends of the College. That's interesting. Um, Clay <clears throat> has another question. It says over, the years off and on, there has been talk of the college opening an outreach office in the junction. Please tell us what you know of this and why it never happened. I know that, um, I, I actually am not sure. At one point, we were going to go into an office there and that was probably um, before I was president. And there was something about the site that didn't work, but um, you know, it still is probably a good idea. Um, you know, I, I, I think that my belief is after the pandemic, um, all colleges want to be better. They don't want to go back to how they were before. I mean, they, they were, we were think, doing some really great things and really um, important things. But as we come out of it, I think there's really conversations. What can we do better? How can we better connect with our community? Um, how can we ensure the success of every student that comes in? So, you know, who knows? I, I can't remember there was a site they looked at and there was there were issues with the site. So they decided not to do it at that point. So I always wanted to do the one in Vashon and I thought I could move over there and run it. 
<laughs> I love it. I love the combination, Gerald, that you are folk that you re remain focused on between the interests of the students or the kids and the community. That's what it's all about. That's probably yeah. why you've been very successful. That's very special. Very well, I was a college is that college and it's not it's because of everybody who's there that college is a pretty special place and it always has been and i just feel like i was pretty honored to work there um and part of the reason it was so special was west seattle the community other co cities other colleges and cities just don't have that yeah that's true I have no other questions coming in right now. I wanted to share a little piece of history about the connection between the Historical Society and the college as well that you probably do know. When I first came on as a volunteer um, trained by Clay, um, they, were, they had already discussed, Judy Bentley and several others and Clay had discussed this program of ours, Words Writers, and they were going to, wanted to have it out at the, the Wine Institute. And of course, our focus was in supporting local authors, of which Mike Hickey is one of them that I met early on too. And of course, the frustration that we found was that we couldn't sell books um, at the college and we couldn't sell wine at Barnes and Noble, <laughs> the bookstore. <laughs> so we had to yeah. find another place and, and um, I thought we thought that would be a really fun thing to do. <laughs> well, you know, my guess is if Jerry Brocky was president, you would have been selling books and wine at the college. <laughs> that would have been good. But that's yeah, how the that's too bad. It would have been writers, a great it used to be, Yeah. It could have been wine and writers. I love that. I love that idea. It, it is working out super too. This is our eighth year. I think we're in it now. A question from Karen Nelson. Oh, it says, hi, this is Randy Nelson. Two, hi, employees Randy. Of, <laughs> two employees of the college that became presidents of the Southwest um, Historical Society include Michael, how do you pronounce that? Prahoda and John Ashford. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't either. Don't oh, know Oh, they're both. John was ahead of the library and Michael Prohoda was head of the floristry program. Yeah, that's exactly what Karen added. Just those two things. Oh. So, so we learned some more. I, I just learned that. They were both amazing. I have greatest respect for both. Yes. Yeah. Judy, um, responds with a comment that the name of Words Writers was going to be Words Writers and Wine or something like that, that we were going to include. That's how we got the W's in our logo. Wow, maybe wow. should try it again. <laughs> yeah, I love this conversation. And um, there were several people wrote in with um, praise, Jill, for your presentation. Um, fantastic history. Thanks for all of the contributions you made during your years there. That mm. came from Steve Leahy. Oh no, I, you know, I just wish I was on the other side because I have so many <laughs> friends in the audience. And so. Martha wanted you to know, said that I think there are a few West Seattle Rotarians watching too. Oh. You are, re you okay. are remembered. That, that well, don't there. forget about the Jerry Brocky Memorial Celebration of Life. We promise it's going to be September 25th at 2 p.m. in the Brocky Center. We promise it's going to be fun. Um, and we will be, we have something that he would be having, that he would have a lot of fun because we just want to do something special for him. Super. Um, Kathy Fom says, Dr. Wakefield, you were instrumental to my growth and professional development at South Seattle College. Thank you in capital letters for believing in me as a South student and all students. We love you. Oh, thank you. Wow. And Pamela Jorgensen said, I was one of the first students. I remember slogging through the mud, smoking <laughs> in the classroom. <laughs> I Trainers. love that. I want to talk to her, to Pamela, <laughs> what it was like. Yeah. yeah. Trainers used as offices and wonderful instructors. 
She said, I could not have afforded the expense of the university when I started at your school. However, by the time I graduated, I had some income and enough confidence to apply at the university. A few wow. years later, wow. I graduated from the U and was a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Thank oh. you for all oh. you have done. Thank you. Pamela. That's amazing. Well, it was a fun evening, wasn't it? Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. We appreciate having you. We appreciate all of the participants and your notes. That was kind of fun for me to um, <laughs> monitor. And we hope you come again next Thank you. second Thursday. I'm going to come down and see your events. I'm going to become a participant. Thank you, everybody, so much. And, you know, fill in the details when I was wrong. Um, but you got the stars of South, of South Seattle on this, on this uh, Zoom call. Good things. I love the, I have to add, just I love the special programs you mentioned that have gone not only viral, but national. And you, yeah. you have every reason to be proud and we are proud Thank of you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks Bye -bye. again, everyone. Thanks to you, Jill. We really appreciate it. What a great talk tonight and, and uh, so much history about the college, the historical society and our community. So again, we're, I just want to echo Dora Faye. We're really grateful and, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. See ya. Good night, everybody. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. That was a good group. It was a good evening.